From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. Happening now, President Biden in New York City en route to an event where he's expected to raise over $25 million. Former Presidents Obama and Clinton also in attendance. Biden's campaign calling it the most successful political fundraiser in American history. We'll talk about it ahead with Kyle Kondik of Sabado's Crystal Ball. Plus, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky saying he talked with House Speaker Mike Johnson and briefed him on the situation on the ground, even as further aid for Ukraine stalls in the House. We'll break it down with Angela Stent, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Putin's World. And tomorrow, marking one year of captivity in Russia for American journalist Evan Gershkovich. One year will be joined by former Wall Street Journal Washington Bureau Chief Paul Beckett ahead of the anniversary of the arrest. Remarkable, Kaylee, to think that one year has gone by and looking forward to talking to Paul uh, here on a day where we have a lot of cross currents and a big event ahead on the campaign trail tonight. Maybe one like we've never seen. Yeah, certainly the news doesn't seem to be as much here in Washington today as it is up in New York, where not only will President Biden be with this multi-million dollar fundraiser alongside two former presidents, but mm -hmm. another former president, Donald Trump, was also in New York today attending the wake of an NYPD officer. Yes, that's and right. And talking about crime. Well, it's an interesting contrast, and we'll get into this now along with our other top stories with Bloomberg's Mike Shepard and Laura Davison with us here at the table. Laura, what do you think of the optics uh, involved here? I remember the celebrity ad back in the McCain-Obama campaign in 2008 with Paris Hilton getting out of a limousine. This is sort of the definition of the coastal elites getting together to support Joe Biden. The contrast, Donald Trump today in New York is great. Does it hurt Joe Biden? You know, it really doesn't, um, you know, because Biden can still go back and say, look, I'm raising twenty five million dollars. This is more than twice what Trump raised in the entire month of February. Right. So, um, you know, and he's got popular figures there. you've got Broadway stars, you've got pop stars like Lizzo. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Stephen Colbert, who's who will be moderating a conversation between the presidents in the room. Um, so this is is really, uh, you know, it, to the extent that this get, you know, this story plays out. This is not going to be a factor in mm -hmm. uh, in November, mm -hmm. but the money will certainly be a factor, you know, Biden has this massive cash lead already. Trump uh, is really struggling to catch up, plus still spending millions of dollars a month on legal fees. Yes, sure. uh, so this is, is uh, sort of the, the play. And, this is, and clearly you see the way that Biden's team is touting this. They're very happy with the, this event. They think this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Plus, they can say, look, tickets, you know, the starting ticket was $250 to get in the room. If a regular person <laughs> wants to come, you can enjoy, uh, you know, this whole spectacle yeah. at Radio City Music Hall. Oh, it's still you a $500 night out. Yeah, well, or <laughs> if you want a picture with all three presidents, hundred grand what is what that? that'll cost you. Yeah, it's definitely a pretty penny. So $25 million, obviously a massive haul, one night only. You add that to the $155 million Biden and the DNC already had in hand when the month of March began. That's like three times what Trump and the RNC have. The thing is about it, though, Mike, Biden is still lagging in the polls. He has all of this money at his disposal. He's showing off his fundraising prowess. But Donald Trump is leading. So what does that say? Well, Kayla, you brought up a really good point about the difference between the money and the polling in our latest Bloomberg Morning mm -hmm. Consult poll of seven swing states, the ones that will help to decide the election highlights that gap. Biden is trailing Trump 43 percent to 47 percent, and he has to look for ways to close that gap. The money will help, but also unifying that Democratic base, which has had some misgivings with the president over his age, and then certain key voting blocks within the Democratic Party, including black and Latino voters, have had some misgivings about Biden for seeing in his administration a failure to deliver on all the promises. So bringing, and this is a rare appearance, joint appearance mm -hmm. by Biden and his two Democratic predecessors, that is a really rare moment where he can maybe reach out beyond the immediate Biden base and maybe close some of that gap in enthusiasm. When we consider the disconnect with the polls, as uh, Kaylee illustrates here, he's got time. And we talked about that today. Consumer sentiment at its highest level since July. We're actually seeing, or at least his campaign might be, green shoots when it comes to the economy. That may not play out eight months from now, 
But I'll tell you, the, the director of public affairs at Ipsos, Cliff Young, talked to us about this earlier today, about the trajectory that could play in Biden's favor. Here's what he thought. Obviously, time's not in Biden's favor. Anytime an incumbent's down because of the economy, the question is, can you gain that ground quickly enough? But what's happening now is what we expect. And uh, the, the economy's improving. People perceive that. And we're beginning to see, at least on the Biden side, glimmers of hope when mm -hmm. it comes to numbers. So, Laura, I guess the question is, how much time does he have? We, we keep hearing people aren't even paying attention yet. Uh, in real America, those of us uh, who are who are absorbing this every day are not normal. Um, so do we need to see improving data or evidence of a soft landing late summer, early fall? What is it? That's really when people start to tune into the election, you know, right around that Labor, Labor Day, Day time yeah. period. Um, though Biden needs to start making up ground before that. You know, they're in still these swing states. He has a pretty wide delta. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to make up that gap, that's not all going to happen in one or two months. And, of course, there's the uh, infamous October surprise. Anything could happen that can really blow this race wide open. Because, again, you know, you're really only talking about maybe tens of thousands of voters who are going to be these swing voters that are going to decide the election. Yeah. Um, so it really matters, you know, what is happening in the upper Midwest. What is happening, um, you know, on the border? You have, you know, Nevada and Arizona that are key swing states. So there's a couple, uh, you know, kind of specific things that may have an outsized reaction on this election. Well, you bring up the border, Laura, and we know that Republicans have a a very big issue with not just the border, specifically the way this administration has handled it and done so through the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who, of course, was impeached by the House. We learned today by Speaker, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson allow, uh, announcing they will send those articles of impeachment to the Senate when everybody's back from recess April 10th. And then it dies immediately. How is this going to be handled? They're still figuring that out and trying to, you know, what are they going to do to, to handle this? You know, neither Republicans nor Democrats uh, want to take this up. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is on his way out. His his influence is waning. And is it the more Trump faction of the party that says, hey, look, we should we should deal with this and do something more? Of course, this eats into the Senate's time. You know, as we remember from previous impeachment mm -hmm. trials, we're getting good at this. Um, <laughs> that you know, all the all the activity stops. All the senators are sitting there on the floor listening to the the various sides argue the case. So it was, there's things like Ukraine aid, Baltimore bridge aid, yeah. all of these things mm -hmm. that, that folks are, are wanting to turn their attention to now that all the spending drama is behind us. That's right. uh, and, and so those are going to be the competing forces at play. Well, we're all curious about how Baltimore bridge aid is going to be received whenever this emergency request uh, emerges. The governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, uh, talked about the collapse at the opening day for the Baltimore Orioles. Here he is. Baltimore is being tested right now. But Baltimore has been tested before. And every time we stand up on two feet, we dust ourselves off, and we keep moving forward. This work is not going to take hours. This work is not going to take days. This work is not going to take weeks. We have a very long road ahead of us. What he means, Michael, is years. We hear seven years, possibly, and $2 billion based on reporting at Bloomberg. That means cars aren't driving over that bridge until after the next presidential term. It will not be Joe Biden or Donald Trump who witnesses that. What are they going to experience in this debate over funding this spring, however? Well, what we're seeing already is a little bit of a partisan split. President Joe Biden the other day said that he expects the federal government to pick up the yeah. full cost of reconstruction. But now we're hearing from some Republicans who say that the owners of the ship that struck the pier, that supported the bridge and that prompted the bridge's collapse should bear the financial cost. How do you actually make that happen? There are, it is much more complicated given that it's a foreign owner and also it may take much longer to get that money back, if at all. And what the city of Baltimore and the port of Baltimore and all those commuters you mentioned and all the port workers and all that commerce need is for that bridge to be reconstructed. More immediately, they have to focus on recovery. The remains of the four missing workers, first and foremost, you know, this was a terrible tragedy that cost uh, six people their lives. Um, and then the, the blockage to the seaway, to, to the Patapsco River. Um, it is a huge engineering endeavor to just simply clear all of that ahead of any reconstruction. Yeah, I was out there yesterday. Conditions for this effort are certainly suboptimal. The water has been choppy. The visibility is low. And, of course, they're also dealing in those waters with 
a ton of extensive debris from the bridge and from the ship itself. Mike Shepard and Laura Davison, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate your time. Now, another story that we've been following today, FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried is sentenced to 25 years in prison for stealing billions of dollars from customers. U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan delivering the sentence in federal court in Manhattan moments after Bankman-Fried said he was, quote, sorry about what happened at every stage. He faced as long as 110 years behind bars after being convicted last year of seven offenses, including fraud and conspiracy. Now, still ahead on Balance of Power, the Republican House majority is getting smaller and smaller. Kyle Gondick of Sabato's Crystal Ball will be with us next right here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. As Baltimore looks to recover from the collapse of the key bridge this week, among the voices of support are candidates vying for Senate seat in Maryland. Republican Larry Hogan, the former governor of the state, and Democrats David Trone and Angela also Brooks are in the running. Here to discuss that race, as well as the slowly dwindling Republican House majority, is Kyle Kondik, managing editor at Sabato's Crystal Ball with the University of Virginia's Center for Politics. Kyle, always great to have you on the program. When we think about Maryland in that Senate seat, this is one of the ones that we maybe weren't thinking about as a potential flip when we are having the discussion about what the composition of the Senate is going to look like come 2025. We know that Ohio and Montana are in jeopardy. West Virginia likely gone with the retirement of Joe Manchin. But what about Maryland? How much harder does that make the picture for Democrats? Uh, Look, it was a great development for Republicans that Larry Hogan decided to run in Maryland. I do think that ultimately the Democrats are still favored uh, to hold the Maryland Senate seat. Maryland is one of the bluest states in the country. It's a presidential year. But Hogan's got a lot of goodwill from when he was governor. Um, Although, you know, I feel like we we have seen this movie before in some other states, particularly um, with the shoe is on the other foot, Democrat, popular, uh, former and current Democratic governors in red states running for Senate seats. Republicans had to spend money in those places. There was close polling. Those Democrats were sometimes leading. Um, but ultimately, the Republicans ended up holding um, those seats like, like Montana in 2020 and Tennessee in 2018. So I still like the Democrats in Maryland, but you know this would be a totally sleepy race in the general election were it not for hope and running. So that development's good for Republicans anyway. Well, I'll tell you what, Carl Rove is writing about this in the Wall Street Journal this morning. Uh, Kyle pointing to a March 12 Washington Post poll that shows Larry Hogan with a double digit lead over both of the major Democrats vying for this office. Hypothetical here, I'll give you. If Republicans take the state of Maryland, is it over? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Democrats cannot afford to lose um, a Senate seat in Maryland. They've got a bunch of other um, uh, seats they're defending in in much more marginal states. You mentioned Montana and Ohio. West Virginia is basically gone at this point. And then there are a bunch of marginal uh, Biden won uh, uh, 2020 states that have Senate races this year. You know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada. You know, with, uh, uh, you know the, the Democrats have done really well on this group of Senate races, really in every election going back to 1994, which was uh, um, the, the Republican Revolution with Newt Gingrich and the Republicans flipped the House and the Senate that year. One of these years, the Democrats are going to have a really bad election on this map. They're hoping it's not this year, but they do have a lot of vulnerabilities. And, you know, Maryland is just added on top of all that. Hmm. OK, so, Kyle, while we're having a conversation about whether or not the Senate majority can stay the majority come January. We're also having a conversation about how the House majority can barely stay a majority right now because of all the retirements. Ken Buck's last day was last week. Mike Gallagher is going to be gone in a couple of weeks. We're talking about a margin of one vote here that Speaker Mike Johnson has to work with while a motion to vacate filed by Marjorie Taylor Greene is hanging over his head. Just how unique is this moment for the vulnerability of a majority? Look, I mean, we we wouldn't really have any any actual modern precedent or really much precedent at all for um, uh, the House potentially changing hands during an actual Congress. The only comparable example I could think of was way back in 1930 in the midterm. The Democrats won a bunch of seats, but they came up just slightly short of winning the majority. But back then, the, the House didn't open until the following December of 1931. A bunch of special elections in that time frame. Democrats ended up you know, winning the House in, in that little interregnum period. 
period. But, um, you know, look, if there were some more vacancies, uh, you could see a situation where temporarily maybe the Democrats could actually have a majority and elect a speaker for, for a short amount of time. And even if it doesn't happen now, it could happen in the future, given how closely contested the House is these days. Well, that would be incredible. Look, some Democrats have offered to to potentially help protect uh, Mike Johnson under certain circumstances if a Marjorie Taylor Greene or someone uh, triggers a motion to vacate. The question is, you know, what's the price? Are we talking about a power sharing agreement or, Kyle, would it be, in fact, floor time for a bill to fund Ukraine? I mean, that's what's being, you know, it's being discussed. Uh, and look, I mean, in some ways, we're not really dealing with a, a traditional majority situation in the House right now because uh, Speaker Johnson has had to rely on Democratic votes to through this uh, suspension of the rules process that requires two thirds majorities to, to pass some of these must pass bills. And there are more Democrats voting for these things than Republicans are. So, um, I mean, yes, the Republicans are still in the majority and um, they have many of the trappings of being a majority, but usually in the House, you know, w one party can be unified and pass the things it wants to pass, but that's just not the case in the House right now. So the Democrats do have um, some leverage, and they may have some leverage if, if uh, you know, so someone tries to topple Johnson as Speaker. Well, and then it becomes a question of, of would it actually be a Hakeem Jeffries speaker after that potentially, or is someone else going to have to try and potentially fail, as we saw play out several times this fall once Kevin McCarthy was vacated? Obviously, though, Kyle, there is still, before the general election in November, a number of special uh, elections that could help decide really how the House is balanced in the interim. Is there one in particular you are watching that has the potential to surprise? So unfortunately for we election watchers, these special house elections coming up are all in, in pretty uncompetitive seats. And so um, once Mike Gallagher resigns, it's going to be 217 to 213 Republican. The next special election coming up is April 30th in New York's 26th district, very heavily Democratic seat. Democrats should get up to 217 to 214 Republican. And then the Republicans are going to fill a few additional seats in May and June and um, get up to, uh, to 220 to 214 majority. Um, but that assumes also there aren't any more resignations or more vacancies. And there's always the possibility at any time there could be a new vacancy. Hmm. Of course there is. Kyle, it's good to have you back. We appreciate the time. Kyle Kondik at the University of Virginia. We thank you for the time. Coming up one year since the arrest of Evan Gershkovich, we'll be joined by former Wall Street Journal Washington Bureau Chief Paul Beckett. Coming up next on Balance of Power, on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. One year ago, American reporter Evan Gershkovich was arrested in Russia while on assignment for The Wall Street Journal. Today, he remains in prison in Moscow. Earlier this week, the court there extended Gershkovich's sentence until at least the end of June, a three-month extension. U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, reacting to the news. The accusations against Evan are categorically untrue. They are not a different interpretation of circumstances. They are fiction. Back with us now at the table is Paul Beckett, assistant editor at The Wall Street Journal, former Washington bureau chief who has been working on Evan's case full time. Paul, it's great to see you. Thank you uh, welcome back here to Bloomberg. There are times when it's important uh, to drop our competition and talk about issues of common interest here. And I know that you've been in touch to the extent that you can with Evan and with his family. This news, though, of a three-month extension, followed by word from the Kremlin, a call for silence, saying that silence is needed when it comes to talk about a possible prisoner exchange. Are you hopeful that something is about to happen? We remain hopeful. We've been hopeful from the day it happened, and we remain hopeful. But the three months was a disappointment. It's been part of a pattern. They've spent two or three months, you know, every two or three months they put him in a cage and we see him and they extend yeah. his detention again, and they've done that. Uh, we believe there are conversations ongoing. The U.S. government has said that, mm -hmm. uh, and we understand that those need to be classified and quiet 
but we are going to remain loud until Evan comes home. Can you tell us anything about his condition now after a, a year of being imprisoned? We knew when we hired him, he was a great reporter. Uh, we've discovered what an extraordinary young man he is. He's in a jail cell for 23 hours a day. He gets uh, one hour out in a courtyard. It's about the same size as his jail cell, so it's about six steps like this. Uh, but he has he's incredibly strong, and he has kept his equilibrium, which we're very grateful for. He meditates, he does yoga, he exercises, he writes letters, and so under the circumstances, he's doing okay. Does he believe that he'll be back home before we're talking about another anniversary? Uh, I hope he does, and we do. And, you know, one of the things about marking his one year, which happens tomorrow, is it's a reminder that we need to keep pressing from the day after one year until he comes back. What, how much does external events that don't actually have specific relation to Evan's case, but given that it obviously is a very tense time with Russia and much of the world and a, a, an uneven relationship, if you will, with the U.S., how much do you feel like external factors are weighing on ultimately his fate? The thing that we have to do is keep him in the spotlight because there are a huge number of distractions. Um, but we also think that this is a business for Russia. Uh, this, this is very transactional. You've seen Paul Whelan's there, obviously, but yeah. Trevor Reed came out, Brittany Greiner came out. Evan was taken, and Alsa Kurmasheva, the Radio Free Europe reporter, has been taken. This is hostage-taking as a business for Russia. So we believe um, what Putin has said is that they want to do a deal. We'd just love to see that deal done. What does he think he's gaining by this? Leverage over the United States. And these are very, very difficult. If it winds up in a prisoner swap, mm. you do, in effect hand back a guilty person to get an innocent person. Right. And just in that, you see the mismatch, but our focus is on getting Evan back, and we look forward to the day that he's with us. We just have about a minute left, but obviously the conversations on the Russian end are one thing. What about your conversations with, with officials here in the U.S., with the Biden administration? So they have been very good about uh, giving us attention. Uh, we're, you know, obviously there are things that we hope that they're doing that they don't tell us about, uh, but we know it's got a lot of attention, and we just keep relying on President Biden's promise to Evan's family family that he will bring Evan home. You've had a lot of support from the National Press Club uh, here in Washington and other organizations. Do you feel the support uh, from the news media, from journalists? It's that one of the silver linings of the year yeah. has been support from you guys, from a lot of journalistic organizations all over the world who have been incredibly supportive and we're extremely grateful for it. It's great. Well, and we're grateful for you being here. As always, Paul Beckett of The Wall Street Journal, we appreciate it. Now coming up, we'll talk more about Russia and Ukraine with Angela Stent, Brookings Institution Senior Fellow. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. President Volodymyr Zelensky saying he talked with House Speaker Mike Johnson about the importance of additional aid for Ukraine, the status on the battlefield given the uptick recently of Russian missile attacks on the country. Joining us right now to talk about this and other issues, Angela Stent, Brookings Institution senior fellow and author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West, and with the rest, it's great to see you, Angela. Does President Zelensky think that he can personally convince Mike Johnson in this case? Well, I think he's trying his best to try and convince him, although we do know that the speaker himself, I think, favors aid to Ukraine. We should remember that a lot of that aid will go to U.S. companies that will be manufacturing mm -hmm. weapons and things that are delivered to Ukraine. I just want to get that in there. But yes, I mean, the Ukrainians are in a very difficult position now uh, without this, these U.S. weapons and the U.S. assistance, which they've been waiting for six months now. Um, and the Russians have made some territorial gains in the mm -hmm. last couple of months. And as you said, uh, they have increased, intensified their bombing campaigns against infrastructure, against civilians. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's pretty hairy living in many of the main cities of Ukraine now. Hmm. 
Well, Angela, of course, for Ukraine to continue making the case to allies that they should continue to provide funding and military support, they've had to be pretty vocal about how dire the situation is when it comes to their ammunition and the like. It's been very public and certainly within the view or the ability to understand of Vladimir Putin himself. Is this kind of a double-edged sword where on the one hand you do have to make the case for why this aid is needed, but on the other hand it could provide even more emboldening to Putin himself? Yes, I think Putin, you know, he's now just gotten a fifth term in office with allegedly 87 percent of the of the vote, although most people don't believe that's a true figure. Um, and he's doing everything he can now. And we know that there is cyber interference um, in trying to dissuade Americans and Europeans, who, by the way, are actually supplying more than we are at the moment. But he's trying to persuade particularly people in the U.S. that they shouldn't be giving assistance to Ukraine, <clears throat> that, you know, Zelensky's government is weak, that it's corrupt, um, and that they should understand that this is a useless task. And I think we're seeing an uptake now um, in these Russian disinformation efforts within the United States. Yeah. Angela, we heard from President Zelensky today in an interview on CBS News. He was asked about uh, whether the war in Gaza uh, might be diverting U.S. attention and resources, for that matter, away from Ukraine. Take a listen to his answer. We understand that there is a humanitarian disaster there, but of course it took attention away from Ukraine. It's a fact. And when you lose the attention from your region to other regions, then it is obviously good for Russia. Russia knows that the world's help and support is not focused on Ukraine. Is he right, Angela? Is the war in Gaza good for Russia? Well, I think in a number of ways it is. And, you know, obviously our diplomat, Secretary Blink, and other diplomats were so focused on trying to resolve the human humanitarian situation in Gaza and trying to work out some kind of a deal where the hostages, Israeli hostages, can be released mm -hmm. uh, in return for possibly a temporary ceasefire. All that um, has taken the attention of many people in our administration. And so in that sense, he's right. And the, the Israel-Hamas war has also been good for Russia in the sense that Russia has come down squarely on the side of Hamas and the Palestinians and has gotten a lot of international support for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that's also what President Zelensky was alluding to. Well, of course, it was just earlier this week that the U.N. Security Council passed a resolution calling for uh, a ceasefire in Gaza. The U.S. abstained. Meanwhile, another U.N. Security Council resolution today was blocked by Russia. This was a resolution to extend a panel of experts that reports on North Korea's development of its nuclear arsenal and has done so for 15 years. What is the signal to you, Angela, about the relationship between Russia and North Korea and how much closer it is becoming? Well, this is a, a really major development, um, uh, you know, in the last few months. We know now that the head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, Sergei Nadishkin, was in North Korea for three days this week. We're not quite sure what he discussed with his intelligence counterparts in North Korea, but clearly closer cooperation. You know, they said that it has to do with threats from the West and other countries. Uh, Vladimir Putin has said that he's going to visit North Korea. I don't think a date has been set. We now know that the Russian Russians are exporting oil to North Korea in defiance of international sanctions. So we now have this new axis of powers that's emerging as a new bloc. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Um, and, and, and this rapprochement between Russia and North Korea has been very notable because Russia used to be, at least publicly, much more concerned about North Korea's nuclear program than it appears to be now. Angela, we just spent some time talking with Paul Beckett from The Wall Street Journal, who's been uh, dedicating his time to securing the release of Evan Gershkovich, now uh, in prison, being held by Russia for one year tomorrow. They just extended his detention by three months. We've been hearing from the Kremlin. The line was, silence is needed. Complete silence when talking about prisoner swaps. Is that how this will end this year? Well, let's hope that it ends soon. 
Um, unfortunately, the Russians usually wait until the individual has been convicted, which uh, in the case of Brittany Griner, for instance, uh, was yeah. so, uh, before they will release someone. But yes, of course, it has to be secret, uh, because if you divulge details, that could, you know, threaten the, the success of the deal. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gershkovich and the other Americans who are wrongly imprisoned in Russia are also hostages of the deteriorating U.S.-Russian political relationship. And of course, this is what makes it much more difficult. Uh, there are stories now that some kind of a deal was in the offering while Alexei Navalny was still alive, which would have involved um, uh, Mr. Gershkovich and I think Paul Whelan uh, and Navalny himself being exchanged for uh, this Russian um, uh, assassin who's in jail in Germany. Uh, but we know that, of course, that fell through once Navalny was no longer alive. So I think we just have to wait and see what happens and try and be hopeful, um, as your previous guest was. Mm. Well, and we remain hopeful, of course, for Evans' release, as well as Paul Whelan's. But the question then remains, even if their freedom can be secured, are others just going to be next? Is this now how this works with Russia? That's essentially what, what Paul was alluding to with us. This hostage taking is a business for them now. Who will be safe in modern day Russia? And, and this is why anyone who goes to Russia at the moment should think very carefully about what they're doing in their State Department warnings about this. Yes, we've seen that. We, we have a Radio Free uh, Europe uh, reporter who's now imprisoned. Uh, we have a teacher who we used to teach at the American school in Moscow that's no longer open now. He's in prison. So, yes, I mean, this is the, the way the Russians appear to be increasingly doing business, as countries like Iran have been doing for some time. All right, Angela Stent, it's always great to have you here on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. She, of course, is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Now coming up, President Biden holding a big event tonight at Radio City Music Hall in New York. He'll be joined by his two Democratic predecessors as well. We'll dive into the details next with our political panel on that $25 million haul he's going to rake in tonight. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Former presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton tonight joining forces to help boost fundraising for President Biden's re-election campaign. They are all three set to appear at Radio City Music Hall for a celebrity-filled event tonight in New York City. And they're going to raise $25 million while they do so. Let's bring in our closers for this discussion. Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, with us on a Thursday this week because mm. of the holiday okay. tomorrow. So wonderful to see you both. Jeannie, $25 million is going to be pulled in, in part because everybody who wants to take a picture with all three presidents <laughs> has to pay hundred grand to do so. And we know that... Biden has proved his fundraising prowess in recent months. It's not at this point, though, buying him much better polling figures. So is it about raising the money or about putting it to work in your favor? It's about both. And, you know, this is probably the biggest night in Democratic politics since Biden's inauguration. The numbers are astounding. I hope you and Joe are saving up to get your picture, $100,000 for a picture <laughs> with the three of them. Um, and it's quite historic. And this is a huge, huge boon for Joe Biden. Not only is it the money, which is critical to your point, Kaylee, he needs to raise it, he needs to spend it, but also because there's nothing more important for the grassroots and the Democratic Party than seeing these three figures come together. And it's quite a picture opposed to Donald Trump, who doesn't have the support of any living president on the Republican side or vice president, even his own vice presidential, former vice president in, in terms of Mike Pence. So they are, you know, it's a good night for Democrats. I'm in New York. It is rainy and it is crowded and there's gridlock out there. So you wouldn't <laughs> want to be driving out here today. Well, you got to get in line right now, Jeannie. I'm just, I'm fascinated by the optics here, Rick. Presidential campaigns are supposed to be about the future, right? The next generation, hope, looking across the valley, city on a hill. I could keep going with cliches. Could you have imagined running John McCain's, camp McCain's campaign to have a Bush and a Reagan on stage? Is this backward-looking thing uh, speaking to Donald Trump more or Joe Biden's age more? 
Oh, I think it's just speaking to donors. Yep. Donors love, you know, popularity, leadership, famous names. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of fundraising envy tonight. I mean, like, and they have <laughs> real entertainment. Republicans have the same country western bands every <laughs> single time. I mean, we don't rent out the Radio City Music Hall and have a full show. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's something that I think and everybody wants. Mm-hmm. Don't give the donors what they want. They're not going to pick up any votes tonight, but they're going to get enough money to go and try and communicate with a lot of voters. And that's what this is. It's the yin and yang. Phil Graham, a uh, famous American politician, said money is the mother's that's milk right. of American politics. Yes, and tonight... <laughs> It's mother's milk. <laughs> okay, so what we've learned is that Rick Davis wants Lizzo, yeah, Queen Latifah, right. to be at his next <laughs> event. To the point Jeannie, though, was just making about how you're talking about the establishment being behind Biden and the Democratic Party, whereas they are not behind Trump. Isn't that what works to Trump's advantage, though? That's part of his appeal. He's not the establishment. So I just wonder if, if that contrast is something that works more for him than against it. Yeah, well, he did lose the last election with that message, right? And so what's new this year that uh, wasn't true in 2020? And so I think if I were the Trump uh, campaign, I'd be worried that this message of exclusion uh, is uh, not as successful as the message of inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so, sure, it's a nice uh, thing to be an outsider. It's a nice thing to be, you know, a former president. How does a former president be an outsider? Some of that is very much in contrast. And, and so I, I think that this is the contrast with the two campaigns. Uh, Joe Biden is selling a positive image of the country uh, and an establishment figure. His biggest problem is the liberal left. And you're kind of, you know, sort of covering over that. And Donald Trump's the fighter where the country is a mess and you need someone like him to rescue it. Uh, from all these, um, you know, negative influences, many of which are government themselves. Swamp people. And, uh, yeah, swamp people. So <laughs> I, I, I think that you're going to see that in stark contrast. Donald Trump's going to be in New York, too, probably stuck in traffic along with Cheney. <laughs> That's right. And he's going to be talking about how horrible New York is and, you know, cop killing, you know, people yeah. all over the city. And, and, and he's going to do it in a way that is, again, part of that picture of how dark America is. That's fascinating. Uh, as the man who created the famous celebrity ad in the 2008 campaign, uh, when you were working with John McCain, this was about uh, Barack Obama, Paris Hilton, and a limousine. Jeannie, does that matter anymore for Democrats being associated with coastal elites? They're hanging out with celebrities and a bunch of money, big ritzy night in downtown Manhattan. Is a Rick Davis going to make an ad about that, or it doesn't matter anymore because you're running against Trump? You know, they could. I'm sure they will. You know, they're already calling out uh, Joe Biden for calling in the troops, calling in Barack Obama earlier. Remember, Barack Obama used to be the closer. He probably realized Rick and I do that now. So he's coming into the campaign really, really (laughs) early this time. And they're already fundraising off of that, saying this shows, you know, what trouble Joe Biden is in. But they have the same envy Rick does, which is that 25 million in a night. And just to go back, you know, there's a lot of of people who are attractive here to young people, not just, you know, you're talking about Queen, Queen Latifah, Lizzo. Um, we also have Stephen Colbert. They also have M- Mindy Kaling. So they have a lot of talent out there who are, who are appealing. So, you know, I think they're jealous. They'll try to use that old line, but I don't think it's going to fly. Well, even if they're jealous of the money, there are some things that money can buy, specifically free media coverage, whether it's in a court or, as you were alluding to, Rick, you're attending the wake of an NYPD officer who was shot in the line of duty, using it as an opportunity to talk about crime, not having to spend money while doing so, other than maybe the the cost of getting to Long Island from Trump Tower or Bedminster or wherever he was. Does that playbook work just as well as spending millions of dollars on ad buys? You know, it's worked pretty well. This is a pretty typical play by Donald Trump to sort of crash the party. Uh, He likes these alternative, what we call bracketing, right? (laughs) Go in, go out, you know, and try to take some of the media that's already reporting in that market. (laughs) It's kind of lost on me as to why he would spend 10 minutes in New York City, though, right? I kind of get the idea of crashing a party, but wouldn't you want to crash a party in a market like Charlotte, North Carolina, (laughs) or Phoenix, Arizona, or someplace where it's actually going to matter to you on the ballot? Because at some point... Donald Trump's actually got to win states. And it's not just about the national media, which he adores kowtowing to. It's just a a basic political calculation 
that these states may not be as attractive as New York City for him, but it's where the people are going to vote. And I doubt if that many people in Maricopa County, Arizona, are worrying about what Donald Trump's doing in New York City today. How about that? Coming up, we'll stick with our panel. Rick and Jeannie have more to help us remember U.S. Senator and Vice Presidential nominee Joe Lieberman. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lyons in Washington. Glad you're with us on this Thursday. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie lets him down, declining to run as a third party candidate, writing a post on X last night, quote, if there is not a pathway to win and if my candidacy in any way, shape or form would help Donald Trump become president again, then it is not the way forward. Back with us now, our panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, to get into this. Uh, pretty fascinating here. Jeannie, you've been worried about no labels. That's what we were talking about here, a no labels candidacy, uh, potentially for Chris Christie. If he has said no, and it would take me the rest of the program to list all the others who have said no, is this effort at last dying? It, it seems to be, but we heard there in Chris Christie's comment, you know, if he was to join them, he would be a spoiler. And that's why we've all been worried about them. And it's Democrats yeah. who have been worried. It's the Biden campaign. It's third way, but it's also Donald Trump who is now attacking RFK because they know a viable third candidate, a no labels candidate, if they were able to make it on these ballots, may be a spoiler for either side. And so I think the concerns are real. I wouldn't say they're dead yet, but it is looking much harder to see what kind of A-class candidate they could put on the ballot, given all the no's they've had so far. So, Rick, what do you think? No labels, no ticket? Uh, no <laughs> labels, no ticket? Yeah, I mean, they're scrambling. I'm sure Nancy Jacobson, who runs no labels, is probably wondering, uh, who's our ticket? How are we going to make this credible? I mean, they could get somebody to run, but is it credible enough? We already saw... Uh, RFK Jr. put somebody who is completely inexperienced on his ticket and getting huge blowback because of it. So I'm sure they're learning from that media coverage saying, hey, we can't get into the same problem. So I think for the first time in a while, I'm beginning to believe that these, you know, tens of millions of dollars they spent may actually go wasted because <laughs> they might not put up a ticket if they don't think it's got any credibility. Well, that's fascinating. Of course, you know, a big part of this story was the passing of Joe Lieberman, the founder uh, of the no labels movement. Rick, you spent a lot of time with the former senator who was uh, a dear friend, if not John McCain's best friend. I can only imagine what you thought when that news broke yesterday. How should he be remembered? Yeah, first of all, I was shocked and, you know, uh, condolences uh, to uh, his wife and family. I know they're going through quite a bit right now. I don't think anybody anticipated it. I know a lot of people who were talking to him even early this week. Uh, he seemed vital and full of life. And, and you're right, Joe. He and John McCain were brothers, right? Inseparable. Flew all over the world. Talked to people in every uh, walk of life. And, and I remember Joe Lieberman even rang the bell for us in 2007 in a Republican primary. We yeah, call up Joe Lieberman, a Democrat, it. and said, hey, all your buddies are staying down in Florida. Uh, we got to win Florida. Could you go down and campaign on the Gold Coast? And he's like, in a minute. How many oh. people have Democrats campaigning in a Republican primary for him? But he headed up uh, McCainocrats uh, in the general election <laughs> and took a lot of gas from the Obama folks. But uh, yeah. the two were inseparable, part of the three amigos. And uh, I know they're probably together now and cooking up some kind of storm for us in this election cycle. That's great, Rick. Well, of course, the third amigo, Lindsey Graham, had a nice note he put out when learning of his passing. But as we talk about Lieberman and John McCain, for that matter, Jeannie, and kind of what they represented, do they make them like them anymore? You know, they don't. I grew up in Connecticut. He was my senator for many, many years and also a state legislature. And that's one of the things that was unique about him. He came up through the party. He was incredibly moral. He was incredibly friendly and congenial and supportive. And when he, Bill Clinton had his trouble, he was the first person on the Democratic side to step up and say this is unacceptable. He was basically kicked out of the party because of his view on the war in Iraq. He came back and won an independent seat and served Connecticut in that way. But I 
I think at this point, when we think about him, the fact that he and Al Gore walked away gracefully from a Supreme Court decision that ended the 2000 election is something we don't see today, obviously. So I think in that perspective and so many others, he is unique in American politics and much, much missed. All right, Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis, thank you both so much for always, as always, for joining us and for your reflections on the legacy of Senator Lieberman. And of course, you continue to get Washington coverage. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. We'll miss you here tomorrow. Meet you back here Monday. Thank you for joining us on Balance of Power with Kaylee. I'm Joe. This is Bloomberg.